Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today to focus on the impact of restrictive civil society legislation and its impact on engagement with the United Nations. On this, the margins of the 48th session of the UN Human Rights Council. I'm Matthew Jones, working with Human Rights House Foundation and together with the Permanent Mission of Switzerland, as well as ISHR, Civicus, ICNL and ECNL, we warmly welcome you to this side event and encourage your participation. You have the opportunity to ask questions during today's side event via the chat box. And please, if you do make questions, which you can do at any stage during the event, um, please, if you could also signal whether you want to take the floor. Um, and if we have time, we will do our very best to come to you um, after the interventions by the panelists. Um, but we won't run past 3 p.m. Geneva time. So that's just to signal that now. Um, we have a, a very full panel today of distinguished speakers addressing restrictive legislation, both from an international thematic perspective, as well as from a grassroots level, addressing various contexts, including Belarus, Burundi, Hong Kong, Venezuela, and parts of the Middle East. But before we turn to our panelists, I have the pleasure to first give the floor to the permanent mission of Switzerland, and specifically to Ambassador Bowman, who will give us some introductory remarks. Ambassador, um, I give the floor to you now. Yeah, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues, dear Mr. Jones, dear Matthews, uh, thank you so much and good afternoon, first of all. It's a real pleasure and, and honor for me to, to be with you, at least uh, for, the, for the beginning of, of this side event. And let me on the onset thank the, the Human Rights House Foundation for its assistance. And, and all the work that you, you did in, uh, in, in organizing this, uh, this, uh, this, this side event uh, this afternoon. And let me also thank obviously all the, all the participants for, for joining us uh, to, to today and, and, uh, and, and sharing some, some of your precious time with us. Um, um, we are particularly pleased uh, to, to, to have gathered such a, a high level panel, including distinguished speakers, such as the Assistant Secretary General, the Special Rapporteur, on the rights uh, to freedom of peaceful uh, assembly and, and association, as well as uh, civil society uh, representatives uh, from, from many uh, diverse uh, region as, uh, regions, as, as you just uh, mentioned, Matthew, before. Um, well, the issue at, at stake uh, uh, here in, in, in this panel is, is the engagement of civil society with the United Nations uh, in the field of, of human rights and the impact that uh, restrictive legislation at the national level, uh, level has on, on their ability to, to do so. We all know uh, the benefits uh, that the inclusion of civil society actors does have, in particular uh, human rights defenders, and that which it can bring to the, to, the, to the United Nations. First of all, I mean, of course, they ensure that discussions and, and decisions at the UN are informed by realities on the ground and that a full range of perspectives are, are heard. And second, they can contribute to strengthening the impact of the decisions taken in multilateral forums by disseminating and informing uh, relevant uh, stakeholders uh, at, at, at back home or on, on the ground. Third, they bring gross uh, human rights violations and abuses to our attention, and by doing so, play a crucial role in the, in the prevention of, of conflicts. And finally, of course, they are a key partner in our global uh, endeavor uh, to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Therefore, restricting the participation of civil society not only has an impact on the functioning of the UN, but it also affects negatively global uh, efforts toward, made towards um, the sustainable development and the promotion and the protection of human rights. For us, for, for Switzerland, uh, restricting the, the participation of civil society not only has an impact uh, on the functioning of the, of the UN, but it also uh, affects negatively uh, global efforts towards sustainable development and, uh, 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 and, and, and the protection of, of human rights. Uh, as a host country of the, of the Human Rights Council, and, and actually more than uh, 40 other international organizations here uh, in, in Geneva, we believe that the, the collaboration between the UN and uh, uh, civil society is, 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 is of a critical uh, importance. Uh, International Geneva is also home to, uh, as you know, to hundreds of NGOs who contribute decisively uh, to this unique uh, uh, kind of system that, that we have here, uh, 
uh, with, 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 with the many stakeholders that, that interact uh, uh, together. And uh, we as a host country are committed to offering to all of them a, a safe and enabling environment for their uh, work. Let me just give you a few examples. Our own uh, legislation is, is a liberal one and does not require uh, association, uh, associations to seek approval from public authorities nor to register formally in order to operate in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland supports and encourages uh, NGOs to participate directly in discussions taking place in Geneva, for example, by facilitating their uh, travel to, to here. And in the context uh, of our own uh, universal periodic review, we proactively at the national level involve uh, representatives of civil society from the very beginning uh, of the process. And, and finally, Switzerland is also committed to ensuring that civil society can demonstrate uh, freely. And in, in the, with this regard, together with, with Costa Rica, we present a resolution on, on human rights in the context of peaceful protests uh, every, every two years at the Human Rights Council. However, supporting NGOs through our work here in Geneva is, is not enough. Uh, for the UN to be truly uh, inclusive, civil society actors from all over the world they need to be able to operate without constraints or fear uh, of violence. On the other hand, states have the duty to protect human rights defenders, including lawyers, journalists, NGO workers, doctors. Um, and through our, our human rights defenders guidelines, we, we have committed to do so. But on the other hand, states must also refrain from adopting legislation that restricts civic space. Such legislation not only negatively uh, affects the prospects of countries that adopt them, but it also puts collaboration on human rights within the UN at risk. We will hear more about that, uh, I'm sure, during the, the, the following panel discussion. But before just handing uh, over, over to our distinguished guests, let me uh, use maybe this opportunity to, to call on all member states to bring their legislation on civil society in conformity with international human rights law and to create a safe and enabling environment for cooperation with the United Nations. And also the resolution on cooperation with the United Nations, its representatives and mechanisms in the field of human rights uh, is proposed to the Council uh, for its consideration at, at, this, uh, at this 48th uh, session. And Switzerland uh, can only encourage all states to adopt this text by, by consensus and send a strong message uh, that reprisals against people engaging with the UN won't be tolerated. Well, again, uh, dear Mr. Jones, uh, Matthew, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, thank you again so much for uh, joining uh, us this afternoon and I hand you uh, over the floor to you again. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador. And it's good that you pick up on the wide ranging impact of these issues, but also uh, you provide a very good recommendation to states because the key focus of today's side event is really to get a look not just at these challenges, both from the perspective of civil society colleagues on the ground, but also really to assess the responsibilities of states and what they can be doing better uh, to increase protections for our civil society colleagues. Um, with that in mind, I want to immediately turn to the first of our panelists, Ilsa Brands Karras, the UN Assistant Secretary General for Human Rights, who also leads on United Nations efforts to address reprisals and intimidation against those who cooperate with the UN. Um, Assistant Secretary General, when you addressed the Human Rights Council yesterday, you mentioned four key trends that your office has identified when it comes to reprisals linked to cooperation with the UN. One of those was restrictive legislation, and it's a recurring theme in the Secretary General's annual report on reprisals. I wonder if you would address the issue of restrictive civil society legislation, how it relates to your work and your mandate, and your analysis of this trend in particular. It's a real pleasure, Assistant Secretary General, to give you the floor now. Thank you very much, Matthew. And also thank you, Ambassador Baumann, for those very, uh, very insightful initial remarks and also recommendations. Hopefully we'll have time to come back to those, but certainly all support to that. And first of all, thank you to the permanent mission of Switzerland as well as Human Rights House Foundation for really making sure that we are having this opportunity for this event, a sadly timely event, I should say, and an urgent uh, subject matter. 
So, uh, Matthew already mentioned, I am uh, uh, here in my capacity as the senior UN official designated by the Secretary General to ensure a system-wide response to intimidation and reprisals for cooperation on human rights um, with, the, with the UN. And there, of course, I would also like to take this opportunity to say how privileged I am to be on this particular panel with such distinguished panelists who are so closely familiar with reprisals, both in terms of the trends and the issue following them. And sadly, of course, uh, some have also experienced such acts themselves. So I, I, it's, it's really, I appreciate the opportunity. Indeed, yesterday I presented um, the, the uh, Secretary General's report um, in, in the annual report and today the discussion continued or comments. And indeed, the, we do see that the, are, there are so many obstacles, as you all know, to engaging with the UN and that we highlight there. But in particular, wanted in this um, relation, the UN also evolving national measures, policies and legislation. So it's all, all across the board, not only legislation. And indeed, the application of that legislation is an issue we should pay attention to. One thing, of course, the problem of the legislation itself, which should be reviewed, but then as we know, the issue is also implementation and how it's applied in how it restricts operations of civil society, and especially, of course, those who work on human rights. And we know that that has obviously a significant effect on the international engagement and advocacy of civil society organizations. And, and we have seen trends in that regard as well um, that, are, that are quite upsetting. We see the impact of the regulations um, in several ways, of course. We see that um, it, it unfortunately limits the activities, the operations, the budget, the travel of civil society organizations in some cases. In other cases, there, there's a punishing effect. There's the criminalization of civil society organizations or advocates for communicating with international entities, sometimes quite explicitly and certainly applied that way. There are the issue of blocking registration or accreditation for international venues. And also, and recently we see what we think is an increase in this, is imposing surveillance on the activities, um, both offline, but also online. And that's an additional dimension, of course, last year during the COVID-19 pandemic that we expanding. So the measures that limit and block the funding that organizations receive and, um, and they need which they need to collect the data to work, to collect testimonies, to undertake research and analysis and, and certainly case information on, on human rights cases and report those to the UN, but also the actual travel and participation in UN activities um, is, is a way where this is stopped. We can see this even in OHCHR grant programs, then when the restrictions are placed on recipients, and we have this as an example in the UN Voluntary Fund for Victims of Torture, um, which is mentioned in the report. Otherwise, the regulations, the implementation of it often hinders and, and inhibits really international engagement. Uh, we have the self-censorship issue, the Secretary General has in the report, and we have uh, repeatedly brought attention to this. It's a difficult issue to work with for obvious reasons or to, to document, let's say, for obvious reasons. But often, of course, we have also regulations that are justified by counterterrorism, national security concerns. And again, during COVID-19, we often have seen also a, a, a worrisome parallel in using the pretext of public health under COVID to also restrict the activities of civil society organizations. We, OHHR, began, as many of you may know, um, to look more closely at the link between restrictive legislation and human engagement already in 20. 18, when my predecessor, Andrew Gilmore, um, held, held the post, and there was an expert roundtable um, that, that some of you participated in as well and contributed to. We have a lot more research to do, but we do highlight some examples, if I just quickly will name those before I end uh, from the Secretary General's report. 
We have some representatives of civil society in Hong Kong, special administration administrative region who declined to engage with OHCHR and the UN human rights mechanisms be, because of fear that they would be in contravention of the June 2020 law on people uh, of the People's Republic of China on the safeguarding national security in Hong Kong that we're familiar with, of course. In Libya, we had UNSMIL Human Rights Transitional Justice and Rule of Law Division uh, that had documented how requirements imposed on civil society affected their ability to operate independently and, and to engage with the mission itself. The Civil Society Commission's requirements reportedly impose an organization to pledge not to communicate with international entities very directly and to obtain any prior authorization for the receipt of any funding. Um, then we have an example from Nicaragua. It was reported to us that the application of law 140 on the regulation of foreign agents, which was adopted in October last year, uh, really affects civil society's ability and the willingness to cooperate with the UN, um, including even just of the receipt of technical assistance or funding. So in order to provide services or do research report and advocacy work. And we have Tanzania throughout 2020 and also the beginning of 2021, we OHHR received the reports by organizations that there is a strict implementation of restrictive legislation to limit their operations and that there are obstacles again to the use of funding for human rights advocacy. And we have seen this um, or where, and it has been reported that it really affects their engagement with the UN. And in particular here, we come to the self-censorship issue. It certainly has contributed to that and something to explore further. Finally, my last example, Venezuela, in December, 2020, special procedures mandate holders expressed concern that the new national assembly would adopt a law that would significantly restrict further access to foreign funding for NGOs. And they noticed, noted that that kind of measure have a paralyzing effect for humanitarian support to vulnerable populations as well. And here we have um, implementing partners who receive funding from UN humanitarian assistance have been specifically targeted for cooperating with the UN. Just a list, we can come back to it later maybe, but we do have also in the report, we have other um, examples and updates, particularly also from the UN human rights mechanisms that have detailed analysis concerning this, concerning Egypt, India, Russian Federation, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab um, Emirates. So of course, that's not an exhaustive list as we all know, but just to have a little bit of examples so we can start maybe the mapping of the kind of impact and the effect that we have of the legislation um, and, and its implementation um, as we go on. So I look forward to hearing from all of you and we'll certainly continue this work beyond today, but also looking forward to this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's, um, that's a really good and helpful overview um, and introduction uh, to the issues that we're addressing today. And I, and I certainly hope that other panelists will pick up on, particularly on the issue of implementation. And I think often misapplication of legislation. I know that you, Assistant Secretary General, in your remarks yesterday um, highlighted and identified um, the, the misuse of anti-extremism and anti-terrorism legislation. And I think perhaps there are other examples that panelists might like to reflect on as well. Um, it's now, again, my pleasure to turn to Clement Vaux, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Assembly and Association. Um, Special Rapporteur, your mandate has highlighted um, these types of legislation in the past, particularly legislation that limits civil society actors from engaging with the UN. Um, in the region where Human Rights House Foundation has partners, we see legislation that seeks to delegitimize civil society actors, including foreign agent type legislation, uh, legislation that reduces access to resources, um, and legislation that criminalizes the legitimate work of non-registered organizations. And, and those are just a, a few examples. I wonder if you can speak a little more on this issue, including perhaps any trends that you see in this area at the global level. Uh, Special Rapporteur, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. Uh, let me first um, 
thank the Ambassador Bauman and also the Assistant Secretary General Elisa Brandt for their word and also for their uh, preliminary uh, uh, statements. Um, I want also to thank uh, Human Rights Foundation, but also the Swiss Permanent Mission for organizing this event, which is really timely. Uh, and then also give me the opportunity also to uh, highlight again uh, my concern around the, the use of legislation, but also other type of tactics to limit civil society work at the national level. Uh, I want also to recognize my fellow panelists and uh, also uh, really see that the panelists is a great panel that also have many people that the mandate also work with on the uh, on the ground. The use of legislation to suppress the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and of association continue to be one of the most worrisome trends affecting civic space around the world. Some of this uh, legislation or law creates barrier to entry that violates the right to individual to join and form association. For example, by prohibiting and criminalizing the establishment of unregistered association or imposing unreasonable requirements for the deregistration of association, such as minimum membership and capital requirements and costly registration fees and bureaucratic procedure. In the name of transparency, for example, associations are required to comply with complicated, restrictive and invasive regulation that impair association ability to operate freely. These include stricter limits on the scope or location or work, severe restriction on the political contribution, intrusive audits and reporting requirements. Such law often contain clauses that threaten association with the registration, loss of legal existence, or even criminal, criminal prosecution for non-compliance. This provision introduces broad and discretionary ground for the cancellation of, or suspension of registration. This has the effect of destabilizing and intimidating association by generating confusion and increasing the administration burden, burden of continuing their activity while instilling fear or action among their members. Furthermore, some registrations require non-governmental organizations to align their activity with government policy with heavy sanction for NGO that failed to do so. Some legislation also excludes certain area of work by broadly labeling them as political or harmful to the national security. My mandate has documented several cases of associations suspended or closed down on the ground that they were not in compliance with this legislation. The case, the case currently with Uganda association was currently suspended. The enforcement of this law is often arbitrary Organizations dedicated to the promotion and protection of human rights are particularly targeted, including feminist organizations and LGBT organizations. Law and regulation restricting access to funding, including foreign funding, are, are the most serious concern. Despite the fact that states have recognized on multiple occasions that resources are necessary for the existence and sustainable operation of association, there is a clear tendency to discriminate against and stigmatize organizations that receive foreign funding. Beyond suspension and dissolution measures for failure to comply with the established requirements, organizations are exposed to criminal prosecution. The common argument used by government to justify restriction on foreign funding is that it is necessary in order to protect state sovereignty from outside interference. These arguments deliberately stigmatizes association that use foreign funding by equating them, their objective with those of foreign agents. It is deliberately failed to recognize the legitimate work carried out by association and their contribution to national development, merely because they are funded by foreign sources. I constantly rem remind states that the access to funding is an integral part of the right to association and is fundamental for organizations to be able to carry out their activity. I'm especially concerned about the abuse of law related to the prevention of money laundering and terrorism financing. This law 
often adopted to respond to the requirements of financial action tasks. First recommendation eight, harvest prodded across continents without consultation with civil society. This law introduced many measures that severely limit the ability of nonprofit organizations to operate, including obligation to register to maintain information of the, on the purpose and objective of the organization to issue deliberate annual statements and to maintain record of all transactions. These requirements are often in violation of the principle of proportionality and necessity. Finally, we also witness the adoption of anti-protest law in many states. This law significantly limits uh, the ability of ordinary individuals to express political, their political view and criticism through protests and, and through other action. My mandate have uh, constantly also reminded states that it's important to ensure that there is conducive and, and, and peaceful environment for civil society to operate. In my 2018 report to the Human Rights Council, I also highlight the use of legislation as being one of the main trends to the enjoyment of these fundamental rights. My mandate will continue to work with civil society and also with council through many resolutions that are put forward to ensure that states comply with their obligation at a national level to ensure that civil society open freely. I will also be in contact with the UPR process in order to be able to influence the, the adoption of legislation at the national level. I thank you and I will be, I will be happy to, 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 to have this kind of discussion with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Special Rapporteur, and it's, it's good that you mentioned the UPR process, and that's maybe something that we can also um, reflect and pick up on later. Um, and indeed, some of the elements that you've highlighted um, in your intervention, including foreign funding, freedom of assembly legislation, are found in their most pernicious form in a country that we have worked very closely on, Belarus. Um, our next panelist, Victoria Fedorova, is chair of the Belarusian organization Legal Initiative, um, Victoria, can you tell us a little bit more about the legal and operating environment for Belarusian civil society organizations today? Is it possible for members of civil society to cooperate with the United Nations and Belarus today at all? Victoria, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, th thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to speak and to give some updates on situation with civil society in Belarus. First of all, it must be said that Belarusian regime has always considered civil society and human rights defenders as enemies and didn't uh, particularly want to cooperate with us. But what happened recently can be called the beginning of a war against the entire civil society. Repressions uh, against human rights movement began uh, immediately af after the outbreak of August protests on September 17. Uh, the security forces detained Marfa Rabkova, uh, the head of volunteer team at Human Rights Center Vyasna. Then on February, investigative committee conducted a search of uh, the Office for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, where they seized all documents, equipment. And after the search, human rights activists Sergei Drozdovsky and Oleg Grablevsky were taken for interrogation and then detained. They were released on bail uh, two months ago. They were detained and they uh, have this open criminal case against them uh, because of uh, cooperation with the United Nations. And uh, on February 16, 2021, the security forces staged the first mass action to intimidate human rights defenders and journalists. About 100 searches took place in one day all over the country. Equipment, mob mobile phones, documentation was seized everywhere. After this raid on human rights defenders, some of them were forced to leave country in order to continue their activities in safety and not be arrested. Back in, back in April, Belarusian Foreign Minister Vladimir Makei directly voiced threats to civil society. His quote, any further strengthening of sanctions will lead to the fact that civil society will cease to exist. 
And this, I believe, will be absolutely justified in this situation. The civil society EU care about, end of quote. And as a result, on July 14 to 16, another uh, mass wave of repression against human rights defenders took place in Belarus. The security forces came with searches to the Office of Human Rights Organizations and also to homes of human rights defenders. Legal Initiative, my organization, Human Constanta, Vesna, Law Trend, Belaruski Helsinki Committee, Gender Perspectives, and many others. More than 10 human rights defenders were detained. Later, after three days of detention, some human rights defenders were released, but uh, the head of uh, Vesna Human Rights Center, Alex Belyaski, uh, Valentin Stefanovich, and Vladimir Lapkovich from Vesna were left behind bars and transferred to a pretrial detention center. About 100 of NGOs were liquidated in one day on July 22, uh, 2021. Now this number is more than 200. There are cultural, educational, human rights, environmental, research organizations, and many others. The Belarusian authorities even didn't inform heads of organization about liquidation. Uh, organization learn about the decision made by checking uh, the status of organization in the un Unified State Register of Legal Entities. And regarding our organization legal in initiative, the Ministry of Justice has filed a lawsuit with the Supreme Court to liquidate our organization. The court hearing is scheduled for October 5th, and we have no doubts that the organi organization will be officially closed despite 25 years of effective work to protect and promote human rights. But of course, despite of these uh, repressions, human rights organizations continue their work, which is now more, uh, even more important than ever. The most important goal now for us is to obtain the release of seven human rights defenders, Marfa Rabkova, Andrei Chipyuk, Leonid Sudalenko, Tatiana Lasica, Alex Belyatsky, Vladimir Lapkovich, and Valentin Stefanovich, as well as more than 700 political prisoners. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Victoria. Um, and indeed, the attempts to liquidate over 200 Belarusian civil society organizations has been particularly frightening. And that obviously comes off of the back of a um, wide range of attempts by um, the Belarusian authorities to, um, to reduce any sort of activity um, of uh, civil societies domestically, let alone um, and their ability to engage at an international level. We certainly stand in solidarity with you and other members of Belarusian civil society. Um, I next turn to Feliciano Reino Gontom, who is the president of Acción Solidaria, a Venezuelan civil society organization that offers comprehensive care to people with HIV, their families, partners, and friends. Feliciano, we're all well aware of the protracted political and humanitarian crisis in Venezuela in recent years. Um, I, I, can't, I can't imagine how an organization like yours has managed to operate in such an environment. And I'm sure such challenges have been compounded by the COVID pandemic. Um, what's the legislative environment currently like for organizations like yours in Venezuela? And, and what are the barriers as you see them to engaging directly with the UN? Uh, Feliciano, it's with pleasure that I give you now the floor. Thank you very much, Matthew, and thanks for inviting me to be here. Just uh, listening to Victoria, uh, my, my absolute uh, admiration and solidarity with my Belarusian colleagues. Um, as was mentioned in reports already presented at the uh, HRC 48, uh, in mid-April of this year, a sublegal norm was issued by the National Office Against Organized Crime and Financing of Terrorism establishing the requirements for all nonprofit organizations, all NPOs, to register in a so-called unified registry. Its provisions are a misapplication of the Financial Action Task Force's recommendations, as was warned already by the Special Rapporteur. According to Venezuelan law, this ad hoc restrictive mechanisms parallel to the civil registra registry in which all NPOs must be registered. Among the requirements imposed to register is a presentation of bylaws and updated modifications about boards and donors, for example. However, we have been facing for years now a state policy documented by special rapporteurs and Venezuelan civil society 
that expressly obstructs the registration of these documents, especially to NPOs whose stated objective is the defense of human rights. Hence, this initial requirement has been made impossible to fulfill by the state itself. Also, the norm includes their discretionary authority to carry out on-site visits without establishing material or time limits, meaning, in fact, that military personnel running the national office can review all files and documents, even if they're not related to the mandate of the office. The norm indicates all NPOs allegedly pose the same risk of being misused for the financing of terrorism and organized crime. In fact, the national office pretends to subject all our organizations to this new control mechanism, even though we're already subject to various forms of permanent monitoring by different state bodies or entities uh, for prevention, control, supervision, and inspection. After registration, organizations would have to receive a license to operate, which could be arbitrarily denied or put on hold. This additional registry is nothing more than the manifestation of new forms of, of indiscriminate requests for information, threatening the ability of Venezuelan human rights and humanitarian organizations to carry out our legitimate work and our cooperation in both spaces with the UN system. This norm was approved in a context of increasing practices of harassment, persecution, and criminalization of NPOs and staff for alleged activities related to terrorist financing. Mr. Diosdado Cabello, a member of the Venezuelan National Assembly and one of the most influential leaders of the ruling party, through his weekly TV program broadcast by state channel and replicated by the entire public media system, recently stated that many of them, referring to us, uh, organizations are linked to destabilization programs in our country, including terrorists, without any proof. In February 2020, he called the National Assembly to review legislation related to NGO funding from other countries, using those funds to attack the motherland. The norm also was used as an, in an emblematic case as an after-the-fact justification of the criminalization of legitimate work carried out by Azul Positivo, HIV AIDS organization serving the most vulnerable communities in a Western Venezuelan state through various humanitarian services, including cash transfers. On January 11th, five members of the organization were arbitrarily arrested after the General Directed, Directorate of Military Counterintelligence raided their headquarters and charged our colleagues with the crimes of money laundering and perhaps worse, criminal association to an implementing partner of the UNHCR and UNAIDS helping vulnerable communities. They were freed after one month, but with all charges against them still pending, making them face the endless delays of hearings of our justice system. As mentioned by Assistant Secretary Brands, their recent report includes special procedures mandate holders referring to the stigmatization of five NGOs and two individuals by high ranking state officials following their cooperation with the UN system, including the fact finding mission on Venezuela. It is also to hinder this cooperation that a restrictive international cooperation law already being discussed might be passed soon by the Venezuelan National Assembly affecting at the end Venezuelans who have been severely impacted by the humanitarian emergency, as well as by human rights violations. Thank you. Thank you, Luciano, um, for that troubling report. And I want to come back to you later on, on perhaps ways in which the international community can help support Venezuelan civil society, and particularly uh, with some of these uh, draft legislative attempts to further silence you and your colleagues. Um, I next want to turn to Dennis Kwok, who is a lawyer and former member of the Hong Kong Legislative Council. Um, Dennis, many colleagues watching this event will be aware of the extraordinary legislative changes in Hong Kong recently. And I, put, I say that with quotation marks, including changes to electoral and national security laws. However, I wonder if you can provide us with a better understanding of the legislative framework that civil society now operates within. How does this affect advocacy and also engagement with the UN? Dennis, it's with pleasure that I, I give you the floor. Uh, well, it's good to see um, some of the old friends, um, especially Special Rapporteur. Good to see you again. 
and uh, uh, and also our friends in the uh, international uh, civil society. Um, it's of course very sad for for me to be talking about this because a lot of my friends, uh, colleagues uh, uh, in Hong Kong are now in jail, uh, facing very serious charges under the national security law that was imposed by Beijing directly on Hong Kong about uh, over a year ago. Uh, it's just been a year, but there has been a complete sea change uh, in political and civil society um, uh, in Hong Kong. More than 50 um, local uh, NGOs uh, have been forced to shut down or that it is, um, uh, its members are facing uh, prosecution uh, under the national security law. The law creates four offenses which are deliberately very broad and um, vague in um, uh, interpretation. And uh, it, sadly, it appears there has been very little pushback uh, in the draconian nature of the law by the courts in Hong Kong. And there has not been a very high, or in, indeed, um, I, I would say a non-existent in terms of the protection of the uh, basic human rights of the Hong Kong people that were supposedly guaranteed under the basic law or the uh, ICCPR. Uh, in particular, there has been no respect for uh, the freedom of speech, uh, freedom of assembly and association. So a lot of the um, NGOs in Hong Kong, including I would name a few, uh, for example, the Hong Kong Alliance for Democratic Movement, uh, Patriotic Democratic Movement in Hong Kong, which is the organizer that organizes the June 4th, uh, 1989 uh, uh, Tiananmen Square candle vigil that takes place in Hong Kong every year since uh, 1989. Uh, until two years ago, they were stopped and uh, um, for various reasons, not allowed to hold a candle vigil anymore uh, in Victoria Park, which uh, for those of you who are familiar with Hong Kong is the symbol of freedom, the beacon of um, the, the seat of democracy is uh, uh, that event. And that organization, which uh, organizes that the event uh, was forced to disband, disband basically. Um, the, the police, the national security police uses the very wide powers under the national security law to force this organization or uh, required it to dis disclose all its records from uh, Alpha Omega from the beginning till the very uh, present day, which uh, is roughly you know, almost 30 years of records of its members and more importantly, its funding. Okay, so they're targeting the funding uh, of these organizations, uh, requiring it to disclose it uh, because they probably know that um, uh, there's been the international NGOs uh, that have supported uh, these groups in the past, which is, you know, for those of us who understand how international civil society works, there are grants, there are scholarships, there are uh, uh, other forms of uh, support in terms of uh, 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 education and also the promotion of democracy and human rights. And these, um, you know, NGOs in Hong Kong have been receiving uh, funding from international NGOs. It doesn't mean uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that these groups are then become foreign agent of uh, foreign government uh, intent on um, subverting the national security of Hong Kong and China. But that's exactly how they are framing it. The National Security Police will issue uh, 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 an order requiring these NGOs to disclose their funding. And then when they got the information, they say, aha, we got you. You are a foreign agent. You receive funding from this group uh, in the Europe and this group in, 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 in the United States. And we believe that you are a foreign agent and that's why you should not uh, uh, continue to operate. And they have successfully forced uh, the Hong Kong Alliance to disband and also the People's Power for Democracy, for example, the, the organization that organizes the 1st of July March every year since 2003. Uh, and uh, in 2019, which organized the, 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 the million people march and the two million people march in June 9th and June uh, uh, 16th of um, 2019, that organization has been forced to disband. So 
effectively they were able to, I mean, no one would dare to organize a, 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 a peaceful assembly anymore because the groups that were responsible for peaceful assembly has been disbanded and they threatened prosecution and have prosecuted the leaders of these groups. Uh, the teachers union were forced to dis disband under the similar sort of tactic. The tactic they use is that, you know, they announce in state newspaper that we believe this group is a foreign agent or that they are guilty of uh, subversion. Uh, and the police open an investigation and require them to disclose everything and then threaten prosecution of the leaders uh, and uh, uh, force them basically to disband. Um, you know, the China Human Rights Lawyers Concern Group, which have operated for a long time, which provides for a sort of a network for human rights lawyers uh, in China, uh, again, has been uh, forced to disband uh, under similar tactics. Now, um, as I said, apart from threatening them, they have actually prosecuted many uh, civil rights activists uh, uh, and bail is immediately denied. Uh, because um, if you are charged with an offense that endangers national security, then um, then you are immediately thrown into jail uh, and obtaining bail is uh, almost next to uh, uh, impossible, very hard uh, uh, to obtain bail. And for many of the leaders, they are just sitting in jail and waiting for the trial to happen, which we don't know when. It could take years. Some of my colleagues who are uh, former lawmakers like myself, will be, you know, probably waiting in jail for up to two years before they even see their trial. So, you know, the common law system that used to protect human rights in Hong Kong has been completely, in my, in my view, dismantled. That basic human rights are not being protected, not being respected, especially not by the prosecution. Very little pushback by the courts, which is very sad. And um, that is the modus operandi. Uh, of um, what's happening under the national security law. And I would say that the tactic they use uh, in many other countries, as the special rapporteur has said, uh, in you know targeting the funding, saying, oh, you got funding from abroad, then you're a foreign agent, then you're endangering national security. There's this obsession with national security now in Hong Kong. Even you know the film sport can uh, censor a film completely on the grounds of national security. So, you know, freedom of expression uh, uh, has definitely been curtailed. Uh, and, you know, a, a slogan, if you chant a political slogan, uh, if the authorities say, oh, we believe that has um, subversive uh, meaning or that it amounts to secession, if it's capable of that, then um, the courts could then uh, convict you on that basis. So they are using old offenses like sedition, you know, uh, seditious words. If you utter seditious words, then um, they would come and arrest you, uh, prosecute you, and uh, bail could be denied, uh, easily denied on the basis that you have uttered these seditious words. And sedition is a, you know, a very old offense uh, from uh, 1920s colonial Hong Kong. It hasn't been used since the reform of the uh, criminal jurisprudence uh, in the 20th century, which imports international human rights standards into these old offenses. So it hasn't really been used by the Hong Kong authorities until recently, uh, last year, when they start using these old laws to prosecute people uh, on simply on the basis of the words they say uh, are, are, are seditious. Looking forward, um, the authorities in Hong Kong are now saying, oh, we're going to introduce even more laws on fake news on uh, 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 anti-doxing laws uh, and also further laws that uh, will criminalize, criminalize speech on the basis that you are spreading hatred uh, uh, against the Hong Kong government or against certain classes of people in Hong Kong. And no doubt, you know, the, um, these new laws, fake news, uh, uh, hate speech, uh, uh, et cetera, will be used in combination with the NSL. So, um, um, because in the NSL, there are many uh, very vague uh, examples of, of offenses, which basically criminalize people if you engage in unlawful conduct and in collaboration with foreign elements. So, you know, if um, I publish a, uh, a post on Facebook accusing the Hong Kong police of a certain crime, and they say that that is uh, uh, a, um, fake, a piece of fake news that you're publishing, 
and you're causing uh, hatred uh, to the Hong Kong police, and you're using a foreign platform to do so uh, in collaboration with foreign journalists or international NGOs, then you could be uh, guilty of foreign collusion under the uh, national security legislation, which is punishable up to life imprisonment. And, um, and finally, I would say that the impact on the work of UN is that um, I don't think any international or local NGOs operating in Hong Kong could safely engage with the United Nations uh, going forward. Because to do so, you would be putting yourself and members of your group under severe danger of prosecution. No doubt they will come after you. And they have warned many times of people who've spoken in the UN, in the Human Rights Commission, work with the Human Rights Council, as uh, uh, people who are in uh, endangering national security. So you're, you won't get a local, that's a sad thing is those of you who know Hong Kong is that there were many local civil rights NGOs who worked very closely with the UN before. That is no longer the case. And I would expect that I would see many more international NGOs leaving the Hong Kong scene uh, uh, very soon. And um, I think there's a need to address that uh, lacuna uh, and see, if there are other ways in which international NGOs could operate uh, and uh, you know show their concern about Hong Kong, but operate safely somewhere outside Hong Kong. Thank you, Dennis. And um, I want to come back to you later just on uh, your recommendations. And 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 personally, I've I've often found it quite odd that we might have a question mark over. Uh, civil society organizations that accept foreign funding and yet don't question businesses and corporations that accept foreign funding or indeed governments themselves accepting foreign funding. We know that this is an essential part of the way in which governments operate. Um, but, it, but we know, of course, from our work that uh, um, the, it's not just about the direct effect of, of foreign agents and foreign funding legislation, it's the indirect effects as well, the, the stigmatization, the delegitimization of civil society organizations, the, the narrative that somehow we as civil society are the enemy within. Um, and uh, we can come back and reflect on that later. Uh, our next panelist is Claire Nevin with the Gulf Center for Human Rights. Um, which particularly focuses on the sorts of rights that enable civil society to flourish, including freedom of expression, freedom of association, assembly, and the like. Claire, the, the Gulf Center has a number of countries of focus, but I hope um, that maybe you can provide us with a couple of country examples um, that might be maybe indicative of the challenges um, that are faced in the region by civil society. Um, Claire, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Matthew, and to the organisers for today's panel, and thank you to my fellow panellists for being here. Sadly, I'm struck by the similarity of the experiences that we are facing, and very much there are trends that, that are common to all of us, which I'll touch on as well in my presentation. So the overwhelming tendency, unfortunately, in the Gulf region and neighbouring countries is for civil society legislation to be extremely restrictive. And restrictive civil society legislation in the region as a whole broadly encompasses the following barriers. Firstly, as fellow panelists have highlighted as well, the use and abuse of counter-terrorism and national security legislation to silence and punish human rights defenders and broader civil society. Secondly, the use of cybercrime legislation is a particularly pernicious example of the extent to which civil society are monitored and repressed in the region. And finally, broader global norms and legal frameworks on the licensing, sale and export of surveillance and spyware equipment have only increased the reach and the effect of domestic civil society legislation in exercising a chilling effect on human rights defenders and civil society. All of this taken together inevitably increases the self-censorship of human rights defenders and civil society whether that's at a domestic level or whether that's with their engagement with international bodies such as the UN. And I propose to address each of these patterns with specific examples from Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. There are many countries I could cover, but for time purposes, I've decided to be specific. So turning to Saudi Arabia, well, since Mohammed bin Salman became Crown Prince in 2017, there has been a notable increase in the use of repressive civil society legislation and accompanying mechanisms. For example, in July 2017, a new security apparatus, the Presidency of State Security, was established. 
and the PCSS assembles the counter-terrorism and domestic intelligence services under one roof and is solely responsible for state security. The increasingly repressive climate has been further consolidated by the enactment of the 2017 counter-terrorism legislation. Article 1 of this law defines terrorism as um, acts that are intended to, and I quote, disturb public order, destabilize national security or state stability, endanger national unity, suspend the basic law of governance or some of its articles, or undermine state reputation or status. As we've heard from other panelists, this is a key example of the kind of broad catch-all legislation that is used to leave human rights defenders and civil society in a state of suspension where they don't know what is legal or illegal. And ultimately, it is very, very um, repressive for them and exercises a massive chilling effect. There's also the Law on Associations, which was enacted in 2015, and this prohibits uh, the existence of political parties, trade unions, trade unions or independent human rights groups. Now, this is very much a whistle-stop tour of some of the legislation censoring civil society in Saudi Arabia. However, these examples do indicate how the climate of judicial harassment and broad catch-all terrorism and national security legislation exercises a severe chilling effect on civil society. The main problem essentially is that human rights defenders who are charged under this legislation almost always face incredibly vague trumped up charges if they even actually receive the charges in the first place. Some of, some of them don't for many months um, after being arrested. And this makes it impossible for them to know how to comply and what is an offence or isn't. And one striking example of this is the charge sheet from Saudi women human rights defender, Lujain al Haklu's first trial after her arrest and detention, merely for advocating for the women's right to drive in Saudi Arabia and for an end to the repressive male guardianship system. But after more than 10 months of arbitrary detention, al Haklu finally learned she faced nine charges. Um, and for today's purposes, I'll read out just five of those. Firstly, having a coordinated agenda that includes campaigns in the media for alleged rights and demanding abolition of the male guardianship system. Secondly, contacting international organizations, Saudi activists and dissidents outside Saudi Arabia. Thirdly, receiving financial support from an external organization to visit human rights organizations and to attend conferences and panels to speak about the status of Saudi women. Fourthly, applying for a job at the United Nations and using her previous prison experience in her cover letter. And fifthly, uh, discussing her experience during her previous detention at al Hair prison with diplomats. So it will be clear from this extract from al Haklu's charge sheet that international activism, interaction with international bodies such as the UN, and even applying for a job at the UN is all fair game under Saudi Arabia's broad brush legislation. The use of cybercrime laws and digital surveillance to silence and punish civil society is also extremely widespread in Saudi Arabia and indeed across the region as a whole. And the reach and implementation of these vague and abusive laws is majorly enhanced by the use of targeted digital surveillance against civil society. And this should be a major cause of concern and a key focus of the international community, particularly in light of what has emerged regarding the use of Pegasus spyware developed by the Israeli NSO group following Jamal Khashoggi's brutal killing in 2018. Turning now briefly to Bahrain, unfortunately, a similar pattern emerges. Broad counterterrorism and national security legislation is routinely used. One example is a 2014 law on information and technology crimes that includes vague and overbroad restrictions on online expression. And worryingly, it, increase, it criminalizes the use of encryption, something that many human rights defenders depend upon in their efforts to safely undertake their work. And as more and more human rights work has inevitably gone online during the pandemic, organizations will not feel safe sending information to the UN and other bodies if encryption and other measures that they use to protect themselves are criminalized. This will particularly be something that the UN should be concerned about in its dependence in countries of oppressive nature of this extent, like in the Gulf countries, where unfortunately the situation on the ground is so repressive that the United Nations depends on people who have gone into exile 
Now, if we have broad surveillance mechanisms that can go around the globe and target defenders, whether they're still at home or abroad, it will ultimately become extremely difficult to receive the information um, because then ultimately a climate of fear will, will establish itself and defenders at home or abroad won't feel safe. So, I mean, what can be done about all of this? That's the important question, isn't it? Um, so firstly, although time constraints has meant only two countries in the region have been highlighted today, it's important to stress that today's presentation and recommendations apply across the Gulf region and neighbouring countries and indeed globally. So the first recommendation to give one takeaway I would make to the United Nations and the international community as a whole is to increase efforts to urge governments to enforce a moratorium on surveillance technology and to revoke all export licenses of surveillance technology and business ties to the non-democratic states. Increased pressure should also be put on companies to stop granting licenses to countries with such abusive and vague civil society legislation. It is unacceptable that spyware and surveillance equipment is being sold to countries where even applying for a UN job is a valid indictable offence. Civil society cannot operate effectively and engage with the UN unless they can be sure that their means of communication are safe and secure as possible. And this is all the more important now that COVID has made us all more reliant on digital technology for our communications and activism. I'm conscious of time, so I'll leave it there and pass it over to my next panellist, but I'm happy to elaborate or answer any further questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. And it's it's really good that you pick up on the issue of surveillance, that you mentioned Pegasus, and I'd like to return to this in the questions. And I know, in fact, it was something that the Assistant Secretary General mentioned in her comments yesterday to the Council. Um, just before I turn to our, our final panelist, I just want to remind those who are watching, you do have the opportunity to ask questions via the chat box. Um, please do um, use that opportunity if you have some questions for the panelists. Um, so now it's, it's a real pleasure and um, by no means the last, but by no means the least uh, to turn to Amal Niongere, who is a lawyer and chairman of ACAT Burundi, which is an organization working towards the abolition of torture and the death penalty. Amal, in the past, you have faced many challenges to your work in Burundi, including significant challenges around maintaining an independent civil society. Can you tell us more about legislation affecting civil society today and if legislation and policy in Burundi creates barriers to engaging with the United Nations? Amel, you have the floor. Thank you for inviting me today to this event. And social society in Burundi evolves in a political and legislative hostile environment and find it very, very hard to collaborate with the UN and other international organizations. While I'm going to speak, I want to tackle this with three points. Criminalization of uh, uh, human rights uh, uh, societies and prosecution against uh, civil society with uh, international organization and a repressive environment concerning the cooperation of civil society with UN mechanisms. Okay, since the crisis we had in 2015, civil society has been penalized very harshly because it took part into uh, peaceful marches, anti-constitution, which took place in Burundi, radio, TV, and TV stations were pillaged in 2015. And uh, as well, other organizations of civil society were managed uh, when it comes to the accounts and eventually they were closed in 2016. Dozens of human rights defenders, journalists, people from civil society took exile and those who remained uh, suffered from uh, restrictive uh, measures against freedom and they are called enemies against the nation. Oh. So there is a legislation 
against freedom, it's really bad against uh, the international organization mechanism. And two laws have been adopted by buried in Burundi parliament on surveillance of civil society and on international organization. And they are very targeted by the government. One, one point uh, one uh, law, and it's against cooperation between Burundi and uh, uh, other NGOs. Article 16 as well, obliging NGOs to open an account to the central bank of Burundi. And when it comes to Article 18, it reflects that there are ethnical quotas against criteria of skills. And in October 2018, the activities of the NGOs were suspended for three months from the 1st of October 2018 to allow the institutions in charge of these to, to monitor what was going on inside these NGOs. These NGOs prefer to close down completely in Burundi rather than to be submitted to these restricted laws which are completely against our equality when it comes to managing human resources. The other anti-freedom law was 1.02 1 in 2017 against uh, freedom of association. And this law establishes a monitoring on the financial activities of civil society when it comes to outside partners or foreign partners. And this law uh, just restricts all financing from abroad. All financing has to transit through the central bank and has a document which just gives its specific allocation. And therefore, everything has to be presented to the ministry and the management of apparently all associations. And uh, when it comes to a repressive environment, when it comes to collaboration of civil society with other organizations, it's been very, very difficult. They try to prosecute uh, civil society with the UN and they tried to fight against lawyers and various other people. And uh, Armel, myself, Amel Nyongere, because we are trying to fight for civil society. And uh, therefore there was, we tried on the 28th and 29th of July of this year, we tried to fight against abolition of, especially against torture. Mrs. Kanyana, Ministry of Justice, she refused to participate to the second session of execution with the committee on the, in July 2016, and she left. Therefore, this incident happened while the Burundi delegation was expected to answer on several questions on violation of human rights. One week before the session, uh, one journalist w was found missing until 2016. Apparently, he was seen in a specific province with agents of national security and national intel intelligence. So to conclude, if uh, therefore all the situation, uh, although our policies try to make some advances and some improvements. However, when it comes to uh, the freedom of certain prisoners, we are still very, very stuck in our situation. And we need to see that uh, um, NGOs should not be suspended. There is a lot of do when it comes to democracy. Of course, the revelation of the 2nd of February, 2021, uh, condemns for life 34 people accused of participating to an attempt of a coup in 2015, 12 defenders of human rights and journalists. And this questions the promises of the government to correct to this democratic deficit 
and governance when we had this crisis in 2015 in Burundi and recent attacks in 2021 of President Adeshime against uh, Burundi journalists about COVID-19 in Burundi is another indicator that human rights space is more and more restricted in Burundi. My recommendations, the Council of Human Rights should monitor very closely what's going on in Burundi because so much remains to, to do in spite of a few advances politically in 2020. The UN must continue to exercise the influence against for the government to really collaborate with foreign entities and an active participation of social civil society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Armel. And it, it, it indeed says something if, if civil society organizations decide that they would prefer to close than operate in an environment of restrictive legislation. Um, and that's really, uh, unfortunately, an indictment of the, the, the context in which civil society organizations find themselves in. Um, that concludes our panel of speakers. We have um, just over 15 minutes now uh, to come back to each of the panelists in turn. There's never enough time, unfortunately, to discuss these weighty issues. Um, but I, I want to give um, each of the panelists um, a couple of minutes each just to offer um, any reflections that they might have based on, on what other panelists have said, um, particularly to be in mindful of the fact that we are in a Human Rights Council session and if you have specific recommendations um, for the Human Rights Council and for member states and observer states, that would be particularly helpful. Um, uh, I want first to come to you, Assistant Secretary General, um, uh, with your reflections. I, I'm mindful of the fact that you, um, in your comments yesterday, you, you gave some recommendations, including um, to states that it was important that we improve our capacity to prevent reprisals. And I, and I think that prevention element, I think, is important and something that we perhaps don't discuss enough of. And, and also, given what we've heard about the difficulties that some of our colleagues are facing, how do we go about maybe increasing the places in which people can safely cooperate with the UN? So I give you the floor just for a couple of minutes of final reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew, and, and to all the great panelists, because it brings more and more thoughts, I think, around, and that's the usefulness of talking together. I do indeed think that, I mean, first of all, despite this audience that obviously is different, I think generally speaking, what we find is that we still need a lot of work to raise awareness. We need the vigilance on the topic and we really need the awareness. So of course, now the ongoing work with the Human Rights Council, the resolution that has been referred to is an opportunity to raise awareness and to make sure that this happens in Geneva and then is brought to New York, of course, also. So there's an all UN and all member states and global uh, engagement on it. And sometimes we think because we're working on it that it's obvious that everyone knows, they just don't want to, to hear it. But I think that's a, a basic point that actually we still need to work on. And in that regard, also, when we had all of the mentions that we all had on, on issues like self-censorship, for instance, you know, the intimidation and that the, it really, when the repression really works, in a sense, when it really, how do we address, how do we do the research on that? And there is a lot of evidence that was mentioned, and some of you very clearly, but to bring that to the fore so that we really include that and capture not just the individual cases when we have an obvious you know, very uh, clear case of a repression, but really that leads to that whole environment that is that is restrictive and that it is connected clearly to reprisals because sometimes we hear sort of a refusal to take it in the same discussion. So I think that's, that's another task we all have to find to do that in, on particularly the research on the impact. But finally, not to abuse my time because you are more interesting than me to listen to the rest of you with your concrete recommendations. I do think that the issue of prevention is, is really uh, a very important one that we need to further elaborate and how we really address all of that that goes both for, but also what you brought the attention to, how do we actually influence 
the revision of that kind of, of legislation that we have now talked about. We see the negative trends. How can we turn that trend around? How can we, of course, one of the things and the reasons we're having the debates also in the council clear and, and, in, and wanted in New York is to raise the awareness so that there is this peer pressure. You brought up the UPR question, but even beyond that, just the discussion of making sure that the image of that, does that serve to somehow really influence something that happens domestically? What other levers do we have? How do we enter into it? I mean, we certainly can show the information, we can show the research, but how do we actually influence? And member states have a very clear role there, member states bilaterally and member states multilaterally in these fora and whatever we can do. My very last point is for the UN itself. We did issue last year the uh, civic space guidance as a first ever guidance for the entire UN system to make sure that civil society and civic space and protection of it and, and really enhancement of that and the ability to participate is something that all of the UN is responsible for. It is not only the human rights actors, but it really is something that should be center and forefront to all UN activity. But certainly I would like to listen to your very concrete recommendations and take those on board. So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, then I turn to the special rapporteur and, and, and Clement, you know, we have so many good uh, recommendations from you from the mandate over the years in this area. Um, but given the audience, the, the, the Human Rights Council, um, I, I wonder if you have some specific recommendations that you can make um, with regards to this issue. Yes, uh, th thank you very much, Matthew. And let me first thank also all the fellow panelists who really brought some national perspective, which are really great. And most of the country that was highlighted here, my mandate uh, engaged in uh, one or a different way uh, with those countries in relation to the national legislation. And one thing that I want also to highlight here is that um, there is, uh, since I took the mandate in 2019, I noticed that there's increase in uh, adoption of such legislation that restrict the civic space. And most of the time, um, when you engage with governments, um, it is always national security, it is always uh, sovereignty that is put forward or transparency. And I just want also to, 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 to also mention that from my, from my um, observation, it's quite, and I mentioned this in many, in many occasions to the states, it's not just showing that I, uh, a state have a, a law on association or an assembly which is perfect, that civil society work is perfect, or that they say there is a, a noble environment for civil society. Because I witness in many countries such as Egypt, such as um, uh, um, uh, Turkey, and many Nicaragua and many other countries that you have in many legislation provision that restrict the civil society work. Even if you have sometimes um, a law or an association which does not have uh, a quite a, a, a significant limitation, you have other restrictive, restrictive provision on different other laws. So for me, it's important that when we talk about um, uh, civil society, restricting civil society space, we really take it holistically, comprehensively, that we have different law, either as issue of access to funding, money laundering, issue of national security, or is, uh, a law on uh, association and how into you can create your NGO. So there are so, all of this that I'm seeing that little by little states that, many states start adopting different type of this law. And for me, as a mandate holder, sometimes engaging with country, it's also engaging all of those law within the country. And it's become quite difficult, quite time consuming. You send, you send uh, um, your comments on the legislation and the next day you find out that the states adopt another national security law that have another provision that receive or money laundry law or other law. So it become really, and I think that we need as a, as a way forward, we need also to ensure that, and this is the responsibility of the state, to ensure that whenever states go to the UPR process, there is a clear commitment of state to revise those legislation. States need to make a commitment. We need also the resolution to be quite expressed 
spell concretely what, what will be the process in order to ensure that a given country comply with uh, 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 international standard in uh, allowing civil society or creating this conducive environment for civil society. And you can, uh, other measure that I can also talk about, you talk about cyber crime law and all of those things, and you can see recommendation that I made in my report, the surveillance issue that is becoming difficult and challenging now for civil society work. Uh, Claire mentioned also the NSO issue. So there are so many things that today, from the physical space to the digital space, we have states that is trying to spread, so to spread those restrictions within different legislation. And it becomes quite complicated for us because before you can just go to the national legislation, civil society or uh, the law on association, and you know what is about the state or the, of the country. Now you have to go to many legislation from the funding to the uh, cyber crime law before you understand really the, uh, uh, the space in which civil society operates. So I think that we need those to be more comprehensive. We need also those resolutions to be more comprehensive in terms of when we talk about the civil society and the environment in which civil society operates, we need to put all of this together. Thank you, Special Rapporteur, for those very concrete recommendations. Um, I now turn to Victoria, and with the, the liquidation of so many organizations in your country, I wonder if you see any ways in which the UN can support you and your colleagues to continue some form of cooperation and advocacy at an international level. You have the floor. Uh, first of all, the situation with uh, civil society and with uh, human rights organization is a part of uh, the whole repressive uh, environment in Belarus, because what we see since like starting of these presidential companies, arbitrary detention, torture, killing and uh, crimes against humanity with no uh, like uh, legal means inside country to justice and to accountability. So what is important for us is, is uh, cooperation with the United Nations. We, uh, we will use and we use uh, all uh, like means. Uh, we uh, communicate with special rapporteurs, uh, with um, Human Rights Committee with uh, Human Rights Council, it's very important means for us because we don't have any national means to protect our rights, protect the uh, rights of uh, victims of uh, human rights violation. And for us, it's very important uh, that international community as well as uh, UN bodies uh, to keep uh, Belarus in the uh, like top agenda. Because as I said, uh, this situation, like we don't see now uh, any, uh, any means on the national level to resolve all this political crisis. So it's very important to receive uh, this support from international community uh, for uh, rights of uh, citizens. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so to Feliciano, and you know, you mentioned many challenging issues. Um, in your intervention, not least the criminalization of legitimate human rights work. I wonder if you have some concrete recommendations that you can make to the UN and particularly to encourage the, the continued engagement of Venezuelan civil society with, with the United Nations. You have the floor. Thank you, Matthew. If, if one thing has a, a been of concern to us is that this idea of a system-wide approach has not been really put in place as we think there is a potential to. I mean, having for example, again, our colleagues with charges pending for months on end, to us signifies that there is something not working. We have the humanitarian UN system on the ground. We have the global uh, mechanisms as well, you know, with the high commissioner, with the assistant secretary, but something is not working because they still have these charges pending and preventing them from doing a, a really necessary work. This happens in many other cases. So I would sort of, you know, think that there is more that we can do, again, with that system-wide approach at the UN level, including HRC, to uh, look at these cases and, and not stop until they are solved and continuing on reporting on them and demanding on the solution, not letting them become sort of a normal situation, having them, for example, with charges so grave pending on them. Thank you. Thank you, Feliciano. Um, and to you, Dennis, um, you, you um, touched on not just legislation that's been passed, 
in Hong Kong, but potential um, legislation um, on, uh, on the books for the future. I wonder you know, if you have some recommendations with pending legislation in mind and, and how the UN can, can better help to protect you know, your fo fellow colleagues and, and their cooperation with the UN. You have the floor. I think um, uh, looking at the Hong Kong situation, um, you're not going to have a civil society within three months. Um, I would say that the whole of the uh, civil society in Hong Kong has, I think, 90 percent been dismantled and the rest will go very soon. Um, so I think for, from, you know, for those of you who know, that Hong Kong used to be one of the most vibrant uh, NGO and civil society in Asia Pacific. Uh, and now that's completely been removed uh, by uh, the Hong Kong authorities under the auspices of the national security law and more laws will come, uh, which uh, forces many, um, you, know, you know, even radio hosts or um, uh, uh, people who used to make commentary on public affairs in in radio programs or, or on uh, YouTube channels uh, have to move out of Hong Kong uh, for fear of their personal safety. So, um, you know, Hong Kong is now firmly within um, the authoritarian orbit of um, the Chinese system. And I think you would see um, more and more of that happening as Hong Kong fall. Um, I think the next issue that people are most concerned about is Taiwan. Um, we don't have a, 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 a panelist from Taiwan here, but um, I, I would say that um, the democracy and human rights situation and the need to protect that uh, in, in Taiwan uh, has become even more urgent uh, after the fall of Hong Kong. Um, and um, judging from the uh, policy coming out of Beijing, uh, it seems that the Beijing leadership under Xi Jinping has become more and more impatient on the Taiwanese question. Uh, he has openly said that we should not and cannot leave the Taiwanese question to the next generation, uh, meaning that it has to be resolved either by peaceful means or by force. The problem is that the Taiwanese people looking at Hong Kong, they have basically rejected the one country, two systems offer from Beijing. Uh, because uh, Taiwanese people looking at Hong Kong say, we don't want any of that. We have a successful, vibrant, democratic, uh, 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 society here in Taiwan, why should we accept, uh, you know, this deal for the Taiwanese people looking at what's, you know, the disaster that's been uh, met by the Hong Kong people. So I think from the UN perspective, you've got to look at how to preserve uh, democracy and human rights in the Asia Pacific region. And specifically, now we've lost Hong Kong to the Chinese orbit. Um, what's going to happen to Taiwan? Uh, uh, to the freedom-loving, democratic uh, people of Taiwan. Um, I think you've got to think about ways in which you could um, further develop, promote, and protect those values wherever they exist in the Chinese community. And um, I think there's a lot more uh, the international community could do, but has not done enough in the past in support of that. And Hong Kong is a very good example in how an authoritarian regime could infiltrate, uh, enter and completely destroy a open democratic uh, society, what used to be Hong Kong. And uh, this is a very good example uh, uh, for um, Western society to learn how to protect themselves. First of all, uh, you know, whether it is media infiltration, political infiltration, and uh, you know uh, what authoritarian regimes can do to remove judicial independence and human rights protection and also destroy civil society. Um, all those lessons are painfully can be drawn from the Hong Kong lessons. I hope the international community would learn from those lessons and also learn how to uh, better pro promote and protect uh, what is you know, remaining uh, of the democratic and human rights values in Taiwan, uh, that which is very important for the Chinese people. Thank you, Dennis. And I come to you, Claire. We haven't um, in any way managed to properly pick up on the subject of surveillance like I would have liked, but if you have, you have a, a couple of minutes now for some final reflections. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I mean, a main problem that we're facing in the Gulf countries is the utter culture of impunity. It's a culture of impunity that from the legislation on counterterrorism, national security, um, cybercrimes has been actively legislated for. So unfortunately, 
by merely reporting on, on this and, and what's happening in these countries and the use of this legislation and its reach, unless we actually tackle and disincentivize that culture of impunity at an international level, ultimately this will continue to go on and on and these reports annually will get longer and longer. So to give an example of some concrete things that we can do as an international co community to concretely disincentivize this, firstly, it's to stop providing the type of technical and financial support that countries such as Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, etc., depend upon to use surveillance and tackle human rights and civil society. So to give a concrete example of, of how we're going wrong on this, um, to take the example of Bahrain, for example, the UK, um, not to pick on the UK, but it's a very strong example here, provides an awful lot of technical support to Bahrain. And there is even, there is even a master's that is used um, by members of Bahrain's Royal Policing Academy. It's organized by the University of Huddersfield in Yorkshire, and it actively trains members of Bahrain's Royal Policing Academy in um, surveillance, in marksmanship, in the use of explosive devices. And so ultimately, unless to second the Special Rapporteur's recommendation that in our resolutions on reprisals, we're looking very holistically and comprehensively on the mechanisms that are driving and, and supporting this, we'll get nowhere. So for example, we have tools that could be improved. There's the Vassenaar Agreement, for example, which is a voluntary export control regime, which seeks to promote greater responsibility in the export of weapons and dual use goods and technologies. And state parties to the Vassenaar Agreement, they commit to exerting effective due diligence control when issuing export licenses for such goods. And so, for example, the Vassenaar Agreement should be updated to go beyond dual use technology, but to really cover specifically spyware that's used to attack human rights. And ultimately, we have to become more and more creative as countries are using technology and spyware equipment to extend their reach. Something at the Gulf Centre that we're looking at to tackle, again, these cultures of impunity is the use of universal jurisdiction. And we have two cases at the moment that have recently been filed with the assistance of French human rights lawyer, um, William Bourdon. And one of those is against the Saudi Major General Ahmed Hassan Mohammed Al-Asiri for the torture perpetrated against Jamal Hassoji, torture that was ultimately facilitated by the use of NSO spyware equipment against Hassoji and, and, his, his, um, and his contacts. So we're looking to hold Asiri accountable for his alleged role in, in organising and planning Hassoji's torture and assassination. And that will, of course, look into the spyware. Um, we also have a case, again, um, with the assistance of William Bourdon against the Emirati Major General Ahmad Nasser al-Raisi for the unlawful arrest and torture of Gulf Centre of Human Rights Board member Ahmed Mansour. Again, something that was facilitated with the use of NSO spyware equipment. Um, and so it's looking at these kind of mechanisms at an international level and encouraging their use that can concretely disincentivize countries from continuing with the impunity that allows them to censor civil society. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And then I just turn to Amal, if, if you're still with us for some final reflections from you. Um, you have the floor. And in fact, um, he may need, oh, you are there. You have the floor just for some final oui. reflections. Oui. Uh, yes. As recommendations, we must stop all uh, actions against uh, lawyers uh, uh, and all against uh, human rights defenders. Uh, uh, all this prosecution against uh, human rights defenders. And as you see, there is a continuous uh, persecution of uh, civil society. This must be immediate action. We need to set up mechanism to protect the defenders of human rights who accept to cooperate according to the council and according to the UN mechanisms, these lawyers, including myself, have been crossed from the list with, because we cooperated with the committee, the committee against torture. Therefore, we must have a mechanism to protect these um, defenders who want really to cooperate. 
Thank you very much, Armel. And that's sadly all the time we have uh, today. Um, the Assistant Secretary General in a statement yesterday encouraged us all to strengthen our cooperation in addressing these challenges. I'd really encourage you to read the Secretary General's most recent report and particularly to reflect on the conclusions and recommendations. Um, the Special Rapporteur has also reported extensively on this topic. I'd really encourage revisiting some of the resources on the mandate's webpage, particularly the document on protecting civic space. And finally, um, I strongly encourage you to support the current draft resolution tabled yesterday at the Human Rights Council on reprisals, ensuring it receives universal support from the council and encouraging its implementation by delegations. I wanna conclude by thanking all of our panelists. Um, uh, it's been a real privilege to, to share a, a panel with you all today. Um, by thanking the Permanent Mission of Switzerland, as well as Civicus, ISHR, ECNL and ICNL. Um, you'll be able to find a recording of this meeting on Human Rights House Foundation's YouTube page later today in both English and French. I really thank you for joining us and I wish you good success for the rest of the 48th session. Thank you and goodbye.